Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all, according to the region of the world you are participating from. <laughs> Allow me on behalf of the Geneva Center and on my personal behalf to warmly welcome our esteemed panelists and thank them for having accepted our invitation to this panel, despite their heavy schedules, to share with us their analysis and insights flowing from their remarkable expertise and hands-on field experience at the international, national, local levels in regard to the subject of this panel. I will be introducing each of the panelists respectively before giving them the floor. Let me also welcome the participants who I see are not numerous and coming from various regions of the world. Uh, that's why I said good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because depending. <laughs> and um, really it is very encouraging uh, to see your interest in this issue of vital importance for human rights. Actually, this is our second panel of this year, 2023, in Geneva Center. The first was on 24th Jan, uh, entitled Defending Women and Girls' Right to Education. And that panel publication has been put out in social media and our website uh, early this month. Organizing panel discussions on important human rights issues and publishing the proceedings, including lessons learned and recommendations, is actually part of our four pillar mandate, which is research and publication as a human rights think tank and advocacy institution, training and national capacity building in human rights, international advocacy, mainly for reporting on major human rights conferences and developments, in particular the sessions of the Human Rights Council, and finally, fourthly, offering a platform for a global, intercultural, and interfaith dialogue on vital human rights issues, such as the present panel. I warmly invite you all to visit our very user-friendly website. Allow me now to present quickly the panel's team, which is Interfaith Dialogue and Reconciliation, Creating and Sustaining Spaces of Encounter. The existence of a harmonious, pluralistic society, particularly in terms of religion, faith, and culture, requires a platform in the community. In this sense, interreligious and interfaith dialogue can be seen as an effective platform to build mutual understanding and tolerance in society. And the term interfaith dialogue as such refers to cooperative, constructive, and positive interaction between peoples of different religious traditions and faiths. It aims to promote mutual understanding, to increase acceptance of the other, to combat intolerance, hate speech, and discrimination, and thus on the whole, promote peace building. The panel discussion will attempt to map and discuss some of the most prominent initiatives and best practices for using interfaith and interreligious dialogue and collaboration. It will consider uh, methodologies of successful interfaith dialogue and its limitations also. The panel will also examine different approaches to pluralism and the interrelationship between diversity of faith, and economic, social, historical, and political factors that contribute to inclusivity, peace, and prosperity. I will now open the panel and underline, as I just said earlier, that the time allotted to each speaker is seven minutes, as we have six eminent panelists. This would allow all panelists to make their presentations for an equal length of time, and leave around 10 minutes for a Q&A session, thereby ensuring that the entire panel event does not exceed one hour and maximum quarter. The full written statements of panelists will naturally be included in the publication of this panel, which, is, which will follow. Hence, the limitation of oral statements to seven minutes maximum is an earnest request. Thank you for your cooperation. Without further ado, Allow me to call upon our first panelist. This is Nazila Ghania, UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, who began her mandate 1st of August last year. She's Professor of International Human Rights Law and Director of the MSc in it at the University of Oxford. She has contributed actively to networks interested in freedom of religion or belief and its interrelationship with other human rights, it's very interesting, and has advised states and other stakeholders. She has published widely 
in international human rights law and served as consultant to numerous agencies. So with that impressive expertise, uh, Nazila, could you tell us what are the challenges and opportunities to support platforms and policies that foster interfaith dialogue and reconciliation and address issues of distrust, xenophobia and discrimination among peoples of different religions and cultural backgrounds? And what could be the role of governments in creating and almost as important, if not more, sustaining these spaces? Naz, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, if you would allow me, I'll give a little bit of history as to sure. how the international community became interested in freedom of religion or belief, how interfaith fits into that, and some of the challenges uh, or some of the next steps that um, I'd like to propose um, that are already active in some way, but perhaps we can reflect on more in taking this challenging arena forward. It was back in 1962 that the UN General Assembly was deeply disturbed by the manifestations of discrimination based on differences of race, color, and religion still evidenced around the world. And for that reason, it uh, requested the UN Commission on Human Rights to draft two international instruments to address these issues. The international community actually found it quite tricky to come to agreement on freedom of religion or belief. So they actually put that aside, focused on race. We had a UN human rights treaty, the third convention already by 1965, and then they returned and they struggled with coming to agreement on a declaration that was finally adopted in 1981. Then they realized that it was going to remain as a declaration rather than become, um, become a treaty because of the challenges that had been faced. And therefore, they created this mandate, um, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, five years later. So in the last 37 years next month, uh, the last 37 years, there have been uh, six mandate holders that try to take forward um, you know, the, the very objectives of um, that declaration, the 1981 Declaration on the Elimination of Discrimination and Intolerance Based on Religion or Belief. So I thought that background is really important because the challenge of interfaith dialogue and projects and activities is also to tackle intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. In fact, much more positively to do more than that, not just on the negative side, but positively create communities of cohesion, collaboration, coexistence, and respect, um, let's put that in there as well. Um, promotion of dialogue is and mutual understanding is critical if we're going to reduce the violations, the grave incidents, the attacks, the prejudices that are engulfing us. Um, sorry if it sounds a little bit exaggerated, but you know, every day on the mandate desk, there are requests for, there are appeals for uh, responses to individuals, groups, communities that have been targeted on grounds of their religion or belief, whose freedom of religion or belief has been restricted. They are being restricted from having, adopting, changing religion or belief, or manifesting it either alone or with others in private or in public. That is the right that is enshrined as an entitlement for all of us as a birthright, yet millions um, if not tens of millions and hundreds of millions around the world face challenge in that regard. So many around the world have this area of freedom that should be a natural part of being a human, to be able to freely explore matters of truth and meaning, to investigate it, to dialogue about it, to debate about it, to seek to persuade one another without any coercion of course or force or, enti or enticement. But we should be free to be having to explore the what is the meaning of life and what is truth, what isn't truth, or what I think is not truthful that you are committing yourself to. This should be an open sphere, yet it's a sphere that is controlled. It is, you know, euphemistically, governments call it management of religious affairs. It is part of surveillance and national security, even though the international human rights standards that we have are very clear that yes, states in certain circumstances, according to the law, can limit manifestations, not the having, adopting and changing, but the manifestation of freedom of religion or belief. Um, but uh, the, the limitation grounds 
do not include national security. National security is not a grounds on which manifestation of religion or belief in public with others can be restricted. Uh, furthermore, we can look at Article 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and we can see that, again, freedom of religion or belief is not one of the rights in that covenant that ca can be suspended in times of public emergency that endanger the nation, even in those circumstances, this freedom should not be subject to suspension and also it should not be limited. The manifestation of freedom of religion or belief should not be limited. Now, if uh, in the next couple of minutes, if I turn to um, the, the matter of interfaith relations, this is not new to us as an international community. Uh, it is more than 100 years that there have been um, established, formal, international, of, you know, at various levels, there have been interfaith dialogues and exchanges that have been held. Are they going far enough? Have we, what lessons are we learning from them? How are we improving from them? So 130 years. Now, what should be the role of the state in interfaith dialogues? Obviously, the state is interested in facilitating, we hope the state is truly, in good faith, interested in promoting understanding and dialogue rather than exploiting it, using religion as a grounds for seeking its own popularity, for maintaining control or exerting control. So if the state is interested, then certainly it can be a facilitator but I would submit to you that it should not manage or control this space. It should facilitate this space and allow the communities to put forward representatives or leaders that are authentic to them, that are true to their own leadership structures, community theological belief structures. Secondly, I suggest that this needs to go hand in hand with an open civil society space so that all activities, so, you know, there can also be universities, there can also be community leaders, there can also be municipalities, there can be a variety of actors that are engaging and facilitating this at every level. It is not, I would suggest to you that, yes, symbolically, the age of having uh, three or four top elite leaders gathering at the international level. Yes, that still can be really crucial at certain moments and has a symbolic importance, but we need to bring this down to the grassroots to be also to be seeing it happening actively, openly at the regional level, at the national level, at the local level, where those challenges need to be preempted and addressed. I would also like us to think as religious and belief communities, whether these interfaith dialogues and encounters are truly authentic and coherent with what we are preaching, what we are teaching, what we are living within our communities. The age of double standards has to be put behind us. If on the one hand we are preaching that these people are not, uh, are, are not favored by um, the creator, that these people are condemned to eternal damnation, then, then what, what, of what symbolism and value, of, of what coherence are these interfaith dialogues? Perhaps we should also be exploring how we, how we believe, how we practice, how we bring up our children to make sure that these are not just words that are detached from the lived reality of our communities and our faiths. So that there, I, I believe that if there is openness, if it is coherent with what the community believes and is living, if the state is not overly controlling or managing this space, this will deliver a lot more, a lot more in a lot more diverse and pluralistic ways. And our 130 years experience will be stepping forward and becoming impactful in preventing violations, in addressing prejudices that unfortunately are still plaguing us. Thank you. Thank you, Naz, for having so well set the stage, including uh, the historical and legal aspects and also the critical, critical importance of this issue in looking forward to the future and hope to meet you again online or better still in person. <laughs> With that, I now have the honor to call upon our second panelist, Professor Fabio Petito. 
Fabio Petitu is a professor of religion and international affairs in the Department of International Relations at the University of Sussex, where he also leads the Freedom of Religion or Belief and Foreign Policy Initiative. He is also head of the ISPI, sub, uh, uh, supported by, which is a program on religions and international relations, supported by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation. He teaches researchers and publishes on different theoretical and policy aspects of the role of religion in global politics. So Fabio, with that background, what is in your experience, what are some successful programs and policies that support interfaith and interreligious engagement on the international level? And the key challenges in introducing and implementing policies to promote positive relations between people of different religions. And what aspects of policies and programs need to be strengthened to ensure interfaith dialogue is successfully incorporated as a strategic practice that facilitates combating intolerance and promoting peaceful societies. Fabio, over to you. Thank you, Umesh. Too often religion uh, seem, seem to be on the side of extremism and nationalism and at the center of a global scenario of conflict and insecurity. Today, however, policymakers around the world increasingly recognize that religion, and in particular interreligious dialogue and collaboration, can be part of the solution and a strategic resource for peace building, the strengthening of human rights, and the advancement of sustainable development. Religious engagement is emerging as one of the most promising fields of strategic and creative thinking in which governments and international organizations can work collaboratively in partnership with religious organizations to achieve common goals. Despite greater recognition of its political impact, however, religious and interreligious actors are still very rarely welcomed at the leading global policy tables. And therefore, today's initiative by the Geneva Center is to be welcomed and praised. This recognition has led to the creation of new roles and offices in ministries of foreign affairs of many countries, as well as new international initiatives, such as the United Nations-led FEDS process, which has produced a plan of action for religious leaders to prevent incitement to violence, and a global platform like the International Partnership on Religion and Sustainable Development, PART, which is bringing together governments and international organizations and religious actors to harness the positive impact of religion and sustainable development, and to promote, for example, peaceful and inclusive societies. In general, a more focused consideration of the role of religion in development has started to trickle down throughout the UN system in the acknowledgement that engaging religious actors can promote sustainable development, as also the European Union has recognized in recent policy documents, as well as the Council of Europe did last year by approving the Strasbourg Principle for Interreligious Dialogue to foster peace and human rights through the prism of interreligious collaboration. All these developments highlight the potential positive impact of interreligious dialogue and collaboration for our diverse and plural societies in all the stages of the peace building process in the spirit of the SDG 16. It also appears to recognize the post-secular insight that religions actually possess resources such as forgiveness and reconciliation that states do not and that therefore, this, in situation of tension and conflict, collaboration between religious community involved is vital. This new policy orientation that I have briefly described is emerging in a new context of what I would call a new era of interreligious dialogue and collaboration. Interreligious dialogue and collaboration can include a variety of forms of interactions ranging from theological exchange to day-to-day -day socializing and common social action, as also Nazila Ghana has explained to us very well. But interreligious dialogue as a sustained global practice is a relatively new phenomenon and has only significantly deepened over the last two decades. Probably the most significant trends of this growth has seen interreligious dialogue moving steadily from theology to practical collaboration with multi-religious collaboration focusing increasingly on pressing social and political issues. 
like climate change, for example. A milestone of this new era of interreligious dialogue, I would argue, is the 2019 historical document on human fraternity, co-signed by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar Sheikh Ahmed al tayyib with which the two religious leaders sent a powerful message in favor of political inclusion and against the discrimination of minorities, especially in countries where Islam or Christianity represent the majority religion. The message was simple. If we are all brothers, then we all need recognition and respect, including the right to participate in public life as citizens with full rights, freedoms, and responsibility. This unprecedented interreligious initiative has scatters, I would argue, seeds of hope for unity in the Euro-Mediterranean world and open a new era of interreligious dynamics that policymakers need to take seriously engage with, and engage with. This is why in a recent report, we have put forward the idea of interreligious engagement as a new policy framework that recognizes and amplifies this novel interreligious dynamics through innovative government religious partnership aimed at achieving more inclusive and peaceful society. Among the forms of interreligious dialogue and collaboration, which carry the most potential in terms of building peaceful and inclusive society are those that recognize and respect the differences of the participants, way beyond the platitudes of a vague, minimal common denominator, and strive to involve difficult religious actors beyond the usual suspects. It is also interesting to note that interreligious dialogue and collaboration represent arguably one of the most dynamic and promising area of active citizenship participation and new social political leadership. And interestingly, as that is especially among young people and women. And this is against the background of a contemporary scenario of democratic crisis marked by disengagement, disenchantment, and a rejection of public responsibility. Of particular importance in this respect is the challenge for states to strike the appropriate balance between facilitating interreligious dialogue and collaboration and reaffirming, as Nazi Laganea has said, the state commitment to the principle of neutrality in matter of religion, while recognizing the need to take into consideration the local, cultural, and historical backgrounds in a democratic society, as also the European Court of Human Rights has recognized. Rather than seeking to lead or influence interreligious engagement, the primary role of states is to facilitate and provide an infrastructure or an environment which would enable interreligious engagement to take place. There is an enormous and explored repository of religious resources and arguments within with which to advance human rights and combat discrimination from within and across religious tradition. On the other, the idea rests on the appropriate form of engagement and partnership the states and international organizations can develop to advance human rights and foster the development of peaceful, inclusive society. Here, this complex process requires an improved level of religious literacy within government. The transition from an understanding of the political role of religion in global affairs as primarily that of a security problem to an understanding of a more comprehensive engagement with religious community on broader human development goal is not easy. But I argue it carries the promise of a new realistic politics of hope for peace and unity. Let me conclude by quoting, to some extent in a surprising way, the French president, Macron, in his recent speech at the International Meeting of Prayer for Peace, organized by the community of Sant'Egidio in Rome a few months ago. He said that uh, Macron said that against today's multiple social political crises, all religions have an even stronger role to play in what he called le devoir de la résistance, the must of resistance, against any form of politics which doesn't respect the dignity of every human being, as well as in fostering a message of universalism, which is not hegemonic and so much needed in our increasingly fragmented world. Striking but courageous and visionary call from the institution of representative of laicity for new forms of innovative religious secular partnership 
for the common good of Europe and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. There were a lot of interesting things to say. And one thing that struck me also was the interrelationship between interfaith dialogue and sustainable development, given all the talk we have of SDGs and climate change. So that's something I would like to go a little further into some other time. Thank you again, uh, Fabio. I have the pleasure of welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Sherto Gill. Sherto Gill is Professor of Research and Director of Global Humanity for Peace Institute, where she coordinates the UNESCO Initiative on Collective Healing, Social Justice and Global Wellbeing. Sherto is also Senior Fellow at the Gellan Hermes Foundation for Peace and Life Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, FLSA. She's also on the editorial board of a number of journals, including International Journal for the Study of Spirituality. She also shares the G20 Interfaith Forum's Education Working Group, and she's a 2022 Laureate of the Luxembourg Peace Prize. With that, Chateau, could you tell us how can we change the narrative and see others and the differences among backgrounds of faith and religion and culture as a richness, particularly amidst increasing distrust and the othering rhetoric. Shadow, please. Thank you very much. Uh, we mentioned, uh, thank you, especially for such a generous introduction. And um, as um, Fabio and Nas had already laid out, peace involves mutual understanding and mutual appreciation. And this is the foundation for us our living together. So to understand is to comprehend a web of meanings, historical, religious, cultural, and social economic context within which these meanings are constructed. So no doubt, a narrative, as you mentioned, that we use to talk about different groups of people can have a huge impact on how we regard them, we relate to them, and receive them into our community. Well, now we heard so much demonizing narratives. And these narratives are designed to portray some people as less human than others. So transform our narrative from the demonizing towards a different kinds of story. We may say humanizing story. For me, it requires a few elements. The first is the idea that no one should be portrayed and treated as less human than others. But to do this, it requires an underlying assumption that all persons are equally dignified and are non-derivatively and non-instrumentally valuable. So this is what constitutes our equality, regardless who we are, where we are, what we believe, and how we live our life, our values in the day-to-day. -day. However, as persons, especially as embodied and in place the human beings, we do not always have the capacity to see things from the perspective of others. And especially when these perspectives underpinned by religion, culture, world views, and so on, nor do we always have the capacity to appreciate that others can have value and practice particular to their histories, contexts, and traditions. Therefore, they're different from us. So the claim that all people are equally real, equally non-instrumentally valuable, and equally dignified can actually serve as a corrective to this kind of partiality. It is a reminder to us that our experience, our perception, always partial, and sometimes can be egoistic in, in some ways. So in affirming the equality, we're not suggesting that one shouldn't care about the local lives and the immediate livelihood, our immediate livelihood needs. Rather, we are asserting that impersonally, people close to us are equally valuable as those who are distant from us, such as strangers. And they can, this can e e equally apply to, strength, to um, enemies. So therefore, humanizing narratives about others should start with this equality and the recognition that we can be ignorant about others, but we should be willing to listen, to dialogue, and to learn from them. Well, the second point I want to make is that given that all persons are equally human, the ways we perceive and receive our difference can determine how to relate to them. And this requires an appreciation of human difference. Indeed, many have argued that 
um, instead of serving as a reason to fear, human difference or human diversity should be perceived and received as important source of our enrichment. And from ancient time, for instance, through commerce, migration, education, arts, and other forms of encounter, communities and societies have always experienced profound fusions of horizons, mutual nourishing as fruit of genuine meeting in a muddy booba sense. So any society that was closed to the outside world, that rejects difference, will find its people treating others as intruders, as invaders, and, be, and therefore we feel vulnerable of diff, in front of difference. What well, in recent, decade, recent decades, there have been global movement of intercultural interreligious dialogue as our pre, previous uh, uh, speakers already touched upon. And this is a key pathways for mutual understanding, mutual appreciation. Hence, we are talking about um, the dialogue is not just a tool to transform a narrative, but the dialogue can also consist in our being human together. And Hans Gerhard Garnemann coined the, the famous phrase, dialogue that we are. So um, the third element I want to highlight is that the arts in, for inquiry by posing good questions um, to ourselves and each other must be part of this transformation of narratives. For instance, we could ask, where does this demonizing narrative come from? Why is certain group of people always be portrayed in this particular way? And what kind of narrative should I tell about myself and about others in the ways that I can strengthen the relationship? And might I tell a different story in that sense? Might I also tell different stories about the people I do not know? If so, what it is, how might I arrive at a new story? So inquiries like this can inspire further dialogue about social political conditions and structural changes necessary for creating new narratives to live by. And the fourth idea I want to stress is, well, it's not only just like Fabio said, the culture of resistance, but also a culture of resilience. How do we perceive from other, not from fear, not as a threat. This requires certain resilience. And sometimes resilience starts from acknowledging our own vulnerability. A narrative vulnerability can uh, sometimes, it, it has two faces. Narrative of vulnerability, of vulnerability can, can be stories of victimhood about ourselves and, and about violence and horror of the other. Whereas at the same time, the other side is narrative of resilience can also affirm our own um, um, vulnerability, our own feebleness, whilst refusing to demonize others. So dialogue, especially intergenerational dialogue, can help invite wisdom, practice, and resources of resilience. And they can highlight narrative of strength, forgiveness, and compassion. And the last thing I want to highlight is um, a narrative of love as a basis for transforming our stories. Well, probably it's not so obvious, but if we take a closer look, most religions, faiths and spiritual traditions actually affirm an ethic of love and a caring for others. So the fertility tutti that um, Fabio just mentioned is an expression of, of an ethic of love. So transformation of the narrative will be less concerned with what each group of people believe of love, but rather it will focus on how love can be pursued and a story about how loving, how we can be loving and caring. So in some ways it is already implied that transformative narrative must be humanizing narrative. They ought to provide opportunities for us to listen, to dialogue, and for us to understand what constitutes other people's humanity in the day-to-day, -day, but also what constitutes our collective well-being. And transforming narrative should have the potential of transcending differences and elevating of relationship with others towards more generative connections, towards more caring. I will stop there, Munesh. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sherto, for the extremely interesting analysis. It's stressing on the mutual understanding and equal of equal dignity of us all, which is at the basis of the Universal Declaration. Stressing also the learning through dialogue 
and this very interesting interaction between resilience and vulnerability. Thank you again. With that, I call upon our next panelist, Reverend Soren Lenz. Reverend Soren Lenz has studied theology, philosophy, linguistics, and German literature at Dubingen, Heidelberg, Munich, and Aarhus. Currently, he is the general secretary of the Conference of Rhine Churches and co-chair of the Interreligious and Interconvictional Dialogue Committee of the Conference of INGOs, Council of Europe. Reverend Lenz, if I may, what are in your view some successful initiatives and programs of interreligious and interfaith collaboration and the key success factors in collaboration across faiths and beliefs? Finally, in this context, what can be the role of religious leaders and representatives of different faiths in creating platforms for reconciliation and encounter? Reverend Lenz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the speakers before we share to Fabian. They're very interesting and inspiring uh, elements you have given. I just want to say something about our committee and how it works within the Council of Europe and um, what our uh, focus on. So we created this during the pandemic in uh, uh, 2021, at, it was an initiative of the European Buddhist Union and the Conference of European Churches. And we both are um, have participatory status with the Council of Europe. Just to understand, the Council of Europe is not the EU. It's um, then uh, has got 46 member states and is the most important standard setting organization in Europe in what con concerns human rights. And um, we are working in this framework and the idea was uh, born after the recommendation of the Parliamentary Assembly in 2016. Um, which is entitled Freedom of Religion and Living Together in a Democratic Society. And it's stated in this uh, recommendation, they support the recommendation for creation of a permanent platform di for dialogue between representatives of religion and non or confessional organizations in the Council of Europe. The, the Council of Europe, um, this organization was aware of the importance to speak about intercultural dialogue and to get in contact with religions and non-religious um, organizations. And we see as well that in Article 17 of the European Union, um, churches, religious associations or communities, philosophical and non-confessional organizations are um, concerned. So that's the legal, I just say the, the inspiration from the from the political legal um, um, or, um, institutions. And in this pandemic, we saw a lot of conspiracy theories, anti-democratic propaganda, and often linked with religious organizations. And for my Buddhist colleague and me, that was the um, inspiration to say, no, we have to do of our own without our communities. Our aim is therefore to put into practice and live this urgent dialogue within the political organization we are working in. And uh, one of the most important point is, and you, I think you said it Fabio, is there a grassroots contact. I think, and that's important for us, um, it's important that the basis, the people in the parishes, the people in the religious community, communities, that they are aware of um, what is going on, that they are a self-estimation or a self-reflection on their religion, on their faith. That is very important for us. And that's for us the key for mutual understanding. The religious leader, you have wonderful photos with them. Um, but what happens in a democratic society is on the grassroots level. That was our conviction. Just um, one word to interconvictional, that implies non-religious organizations as well. And for one reason, and is that we have 
we are all sharing values, strong values, which are um, and strong values are that one stands up for regardless of the circumstances. So we are in consciously or consciously always um, basing our deeds, what we are doing on strong values. And that is one point we are sharing light and we can say it with a, a French expression of uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité. That's points for us, which is very important human dignity as well. So therefore we said, what do we need is in democratic societies, people, citizens who are aware of themselves, of their face, they can express it, they can reflect it. Just to this, in a democratic society, we have got one paradox that you are in democratic states, um, you can't force people to have democratic, uh, democratic spirit. That's the a big uh, uh, paradox of, in, of this democracy who are based on freedom, individual freedom, as we have this in human rights. So people, citizens, individuals, are based or have convictions knitted to strong values and they directly concern the individual, individual on this existential level. It's not always about praying, but it's as well as about feeling and I share to say it about, about emotions, about how I feel myself. And then comes in, in what we are interested in, in our, um, in our task, the actual task is that we think for a fruitful dialogue, we need individuals who are, have self-reflection, who can express themselves about their faith and they can their relatives themselves. So a certain, certain self-awareness, um, um, we need people who are able and uh, capable to have this. And that's um, that's only possible with a holistic education, which not only concerns the tradition of facts and reads in religions, but it concerns yourself. How do you see yourself? So our point was, um, is at the moment, our actual work is we are collecting and um, looking for, searching for non-formal education programs, which just are going, are focusing on this religious education against hate speech, against intolerance, against all form of discrimination of the other because of another religious or non-religious conviction. And and to end with this, for me, the most important thing for this basis is that you have, that you can create a safe spaces where you can express yourself, where you can dialogue, where you can see controversial things. And that's important. There's not a media or the other things which are disturbing this. The second thing is you have to clearly say limits. Yes, there's a limit. What can we do? What can we not do? What can we achieve in a dialogue? What can we cannot achieve? So you have to clearly this elements pointed out. And the, the, the uh, next two things are important. It's for the internal disposition of the individuals, of the persons who are um, in this dialogue, it's this mutual recognition of the dignity of the other. And the fourth point is we need confidence, confidence in the other um, that at the first point, the other doesn't want to, um, um, doesn't want to uh, hurt me. That's the most important thing, I think, these four points. And therefore, because we have created in our um, dialogue committee, which is just at the beginning, 
I think we have created a safe space where we can discuss and when we can share values and where we can encourage and share with other organizations what is important for us in our um, life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Lenz, for that in-depth analysis and uh, very insightful recommendations and observations. With that, I am pleased to welcome our following speaker, Dr. Kezevino Aram. Dr. Aram has been part of interfaith dialogue efforts for the past 20 years. She has led critical child development initiatives globally and across rural India. Together with Shanti Ashram's partnership platform encompassing 215 partners, she is deeply committed to integrated human development initiatives. She has received several awards for her work and authored a variety of publications. Vino, if I may, how do you think platforms of interfaith and interreligious encounter can be built and sustained at the community level? And how can reconciliation be promoted, particularly in societies where distrust between peoples of different cultures, faiths, and religions runs deep in the social fabric? We know the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Umesh. It's been a pleasure listening to everyone. And I want to reiterate where Dr. Fabio said, oftentimes religion is seen as a part of the problem. Uh, and I think this, this premise uh, uh, is challenged at the local levels, uh, at the community level, even in the most recent COVID-19 pandemic. We saw how religious communities were in the forefront serving people, serving one another and serving communities. Umesh, allow me to use my five or six minutes uh, to describe four things. I wanna go back to this whole space of interreligious dialogue from the global to the community, from the community to the uh, pan-continental approach that we have today. This is not new. Uh, this, uh, this desire for religion and religious organizations and people of faith to be in dialogue goes back many, many years and we can find multiple moments in history where we can trace the aspiration to concrete efforts. In my own country, India, uh, it was a very definitive part and a distinctive part of the freedom struggle, acknowledging that India is home to many religious tradition and has welcomed many religious traditions from around the world. One of Mahatma Gandhi's uh, deep commitment was to see the coming together of religions and religious communities and faith in, in public space. We can go back to the encounter of St. Francis uh, and his journey uh, to the Middle East. So this desire to be in dialogue, this desire to find common ground has a very long timeline. But I think it is in the last 20, 30 years, and I'm very grateful to Professor Lenz, to Sherto, to others of bringing these moments in recent contemporary history, when we find that this, this space of interreligious dialogue is being acknowledged by one societal pillar in a more clear way, and I think in a little bit more respectful way, and that is from the government. So with that background in mind, I'd like to also draw on three examples as to how this movement for interreligious dialogue came. Let me draw on the work of one of the world's largest interreligious organizations, Religions for Peace in the 1940s. It was around an issue of nuclear disarmament that religious communities came together uh, and they saw the work for disarmament both in their own nations but at the UN as a commitment to peace building. Now Religions for Peace has celebrated 50 years of its work and what you see is both. You see that they, are con they continue to bring people at multiple levels to be in dialogue, but they also continue to find contemporary issues that allow them to explore their faith in action. This is one model and it goes back to more than five decades. There is another model and that model that I, I respect and appreciate very much, which is looking at the area of education. Professor Sherto Gill spoke about it, Dr. Nazila spoke about it, Dr. Lenz spoke about it. Now education as we see it today, doesn't fully nurture the holistic development of a child. My own expertise is in the area of child health and child development. It has been found to be deficient 
And therefore, the dialogue that has extended both between governmental institutions, which are looked upon as primary responders to the need for children's education, but also societal institutions, including religion, where we desire that ethics and moral education and value-based practices be integrated to it. Here, the work of Arigato International, for example, to find common ground. And here is something that I want to present. Uh, Sherto, my, my dear friend and colleague, spoke about resilience. We know that just simply mathematics and science and physics and philosophy will not be enough, but we will have to give children a moment to see how their own innate gifts, their internal strengths connects with the needs of society. That is where active resilience is, uh, is, is built and, and children are allowed to practice that. Here, Professor Lenz, we have two or three resources that have come in the last 20 years, precisely contributing both to the formal space, but to the non-formal space, which we know is an equally important learning space for children. You know, the Early Childhood Consortium, for example, at Arigato International, have brought in a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional uh, uh, ar arrangement and engagement to come up with a toolkit that was there for adaptation and implementation. We're in the process of implementing it in many parts of the world. So again, uh, Umesh, going back to you, not just the timeline, but the reasons why religion came together. Now, one may say dialogue per se is equally valuable when people meet and people meet in safe spaces, in respectful spaces, new things happen. But when people meet also, with concrete issues, then I think what it does is it allows for us to move from theological interpretations alone or in isolation to finding what is common. And I think that is the very purpose of interfaith dialogue. It is to find that common ground that allows us to be respectful of distinct differences and diversity and yet find common ground to see how we can work together. And this is why I think the third part of my presentation becomes important. All of us know that today interfaith dialogue in some ways is equated to a colorful picture of leaders coming together and making uh, statements. In fact, we bring them together and we criticize them for making these statements. So it's kind of a welcome, but no welcome. You know, I, we welcome you to kind of give you a little bit of our own, um, if I may say, bias towards this coming together. But I think what we have to do now is to see that picture in a continuum, the coming together of religious leaders, not in isolation with what is done at the community, but in a continuum of what can be done in the community. In fact, um, uh, Dr. Nazila speaking in the opening spoke about the state's role in interreligious dialogue. I think the state has a role and sometimes the state has a very important role to be a respectful partner uh, and not always someone who facilitates or enables, but co-creates these spaces. We saw this during COVID pandemic in India, how the misinformation campaign needed all of us to work together and each of us in our own languages uh, of, 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 of proficiency, but also of practice, we found how religious communities could be at the aid, not only about uh, reinforcing science and its solidarity with spirituality, but also speaking about service and how service could be a place where we could come together. Umesh, my very final point is, is, is on the community. Um, and let me reiterate why I say this with a capital C. Um, we have always spoken about the value of community, but sometimes not valued the community enough. In the new landscape of collaboration and cooperation, the hierarchy of global to local also presents value in the same descending order. The global being the most valued and the local being the most, smallest or the least valued. And the pandemic has shown us that this has to be positively disrupted. We know that communities can be isolated in times of the pandemic, but the communities can also provide very valuable lessons to uh, the big picture formulations. And here is where I think the, the question that you raise, Umesh, how can they be created and how can they be sustained? We can find answers. How can they be created? First, to see the spaces 
we have in which dialogue of multiple uh, a diversity of approaches uh, uh, that facilitate dialogue. In fact, in my own country, uh, we've often had this discussion, is dialogue always around the table? Is dialogue always intellectual? Not true. I think we have to hear one another. And in the Hindu tradition, we call it the jnana marga, the pursuit of knowledge. Dialogue can be facilitated through action, the seva, the space of service. There too, you have to speak to one another and you discover one another. There is the space of leadership. And today I saw the comments, leadership in every space, whether it's government, in, in the private sector, in civil society, we are all witness to a leadership style that doesn't include the voices of women and young people in equal measure. So religion is no different. Uh, they in fact mirror every other societal institution. And there, I think in the path of leadership, again, we have a very vital role to play. And there is positive news from the field of interfaith dialogue because there is a genuine effort to bring in women and, and young people. In fact, I may argue that the work of Arigato International, for example, building young citizens uh, are with greater understanding of, of values and, and leadership styles contributes to populating these spaces even at the community level. And finally, I think it's also very important to look at the new institutions that are coming into foray to bring governments together. So it's not only uh, you know, institutions that have been there for 50 years and going on like Religions for Peace, institutions like Arigata International with a very specific mandate of drawing our attention both within faith communities and beyond working for children, but also Kaisit, for example, which is an intergovernmental effort. So the different dimensions of interreligious dialogue, as Professor Fabio Petito mentioned, is also being supported by institutional frameworks. What we do need is conversations like this, and I'm grateful to the Geneva Human Rights Center for understanding this space better, for valuing the spaces from the local to the global better, and to see that what is the end outcome of dialogue such as this is, uh, is a society that benefits uh, from the richness of religion, but also from the richness of its lived experience and its infrastructure and, and organizational structures. So if I may end with the words of Mahatma Gandhi, what we do today will determine our tomorrow. And I think what we do today in terms of understanding interreligious dialogue, the need to creating and sustaining these spaces will require all our efforts so that it may lead to uh, a, a situation where we don't see it only as part of the problem, but we see it as a strategic resource in also unleashing the power of positive peace in the 21st century. Thank you, Omesh. Thank you very much, Vino, for those very valuable observations, which along with the others will greatly contribute to building, our, drafting our lessons learned and ways forward chapter of the panel publication. I now have the privilege of calling upon our final panelist, Dr. Bakari Sambe, Regional Director of the Timbuktu African Institute for Peace Studies, Dakar Niame Bamako. Sambe's current work focuses on endogenous strategies, cross-border dynamics, and experimenting with agile approaches in crisis zones. An expert working with the United Nations, European Union, African Union, he has notably designed and led advocacy for the establishment of the regional group for the prevention and fight against radicalization of the G5 Sahel. With this expertise and experience, Bakari, could you briefly tell us what can be the role of interfaith dialogue in the fight against radicalization? And how can it help pave the way to reconciliation, particularly in West Africa and the Sahel region? Uh, briefly, as I said, bearing in mind that we are running out of time. So if you could stay at seven minutes and then your full statement would be published in the panel publication. Over to you, Bakari. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to, to to take part in this meeting, and I will try to to make it in English, uh, and it will be a good exercise for me. Um, as you may know, uh, this last year uh, uh, we were discussing uh, about radicalization in the region, 
and I have the chance to be uh, to have an assignment from the United Nations Office of West Africa to meet religious leaders in the beginning of the 20s in order to discuss this issue. I have met some one of the most important scholar in West Africa, living in Mauritania. His name in Mauritania. His name is uh, Ba Wulda Abdullah. I ask him. I have a question. He tell me, please ask your question. I said to him, my question is, what are the causes of radicalization and what are the solutions? And he replied that he will answer to my question in one sentence. And he said that in Arabic, سَبَبُ كُلُّ ذَلِكَ غَطْرَسَةُ الظَّالِمِينَ وَجَهْلُ الْمَظْلُومِينَ The cause of the, the most important part of our conflict and radicalization is uh, the combination between the arrogance of unjust and the ignorance of victim. And uh, I can understand from him uh, through all the research we have done in the region, we can now try without mm, uh, major risk to classify the so-called radicalized people in two categories. You have those one who are seeking for meaning and the others who are seeking for means. And uh, while discussing with a very important uh, European uh, authorities coming to Senegal for a visit, I tell her, you know, uh, uh, now uh, I'm, 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 I'm somewhere ensured because we are becoming a real international community. Why? In the past, when people were talking about international community, they think about the five powerful countries who can vote uh, against everything and for everything in the world. Now, more and more, we are becoming an international community of, uh, of equal, uh, uh, of vulnerable. Vulnerability make us equal. Vulnerability toward disease like COVID-19, vulnerability uh, toward insecurity, and vulnerability toward wars. Some years ago, some decade ago, when people were talking about uh, uh, disease and wars and hunger, they were thinking about Africa. And the example of Ukraine showed that we are more and more becoming an international community and an equal international community uh, toward vulnerability. One may ask this following question, is the dialogue trapped by the exacerbation of communitarism and mistrust funded by international event and national populism? Or does it suffer from the vagaries of a conflict that poisons the perception that communities have of each other? And because these unfavorable actor, factors uh, has an effort being made to ask the real question in order to hope for the adequate questions. I think that I'm, I will not today emphasize on the possibility of dialogue between Muslim and Christian. We know all this. We have learned a lot about all these meetings, as said my colleague from India. And the issue is now how to, if not to, to organize uh, 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 interface dialogue and uh, dialogue uh, summit or session. The issue is how to teach tolerance, how to teach dialogue. And we know all of us how the different religions can discuss, can understand each other. I will not uh, uh, be able to, 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 to give you all the verses and everything, you, you, you know it. And uh, in Africa, we are assisting to a rising of extremism in all forms of religiosity. And uh, uh, this kind, we are really shocking in the beginning, uh, in, in uh, 2010, when uh, Mali was attacked. How Mali was attacked? They tried to destroy the, um, the, the monument of Timbuktu, this very huge city of knowledge and tolerance. It was from our perspective as an African, a tentative to an attempt to deny the African contribution uh, to the very uh, huge Islamic civilization. And I think that uh, now 
we can see that uh, 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 all these things, uh, 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 this will not be easy uh, task if already uh, uh, we, we if we already know the reservation of radical and extremist uh, camps, which more often than not by simple abuse of conscience control the interpretation and make an ideological takeover of liberating exegesis in our own religions. So we have not a problem, uh, a clash between the religion. We have a clash of the extremes in, in this religion. In other words, the arrogance of those who still erect worlds of misunderstanding between people must not weaken the will of those who are ready to build the bridge to promote encounter and dialogue without falling into an excess of hope. We can nevertheless believe in the future of other city. We what could be reassuring that uh, is uh, that many of the uh, uh, utopias of the past are beginning to reveal themselves day by day as uh, premature truth. In the Sahel, exactly uh, uh, when they destroy this Timbuktu uh, pa uh, pa uh, heritage, it was. Uh, how to deny the contribution of Africa in Islamic civilization, imposing as the Salafism and the Wahhabism. This initiative uh, we can have ab about in, in Africa, we have to recognize uh, uh, the dignity of solution for the indigenous initiative. This issue is in Africa with our international partners is how to, pro how to promote the, this mechanism of community re uh, regulation based on ancestral alliances between uh, uh, people, uh, between population that recognize themselves more than in other institutional approach adopted in the framework of classical stabilization process. Similar initiatives you can have it in Burkina Faso, in Mali, are being to be undertaken by community. In the Sahel crisis, and I think that there is the gap, there is a kind of gap the gap between the international approach and local perception, which has sometimes seriously undermined the very spirit of cooperation. Uh, and it is uh, uh, press, uh, precisely due to the absence of a paradigmatic break that uh, is required by the change in, uh, in the region, in our region, uh, under, uh, undergoing rapid change. And I think that to, uh, to just finish, because I, I talk a lot, this last year, Timbuktu has been, uh, in collaboration with the United Nations Office of West Africa and Sahel, have organized some interesting meetings. It was uh, to try to map and target actors integrated in the group uh, of traditional and legit uh, in religious legitimacy. In our French-speaking countries, we were uh, marked by the, the French secularism, like laïcité, and our society are purely religious how to disconnect people from their belief in, in order to have the right to express themselves in the public sphere. And learning from this uh, failure, we try in the region to uh, work with uh, uh, how to um, involve religious and traditional legitimacies in order to construct peace and, and dialogue. There are institutional and, uh, and non-institutional religious leaders from, uh, and guides, uh, customary chiefs, traditional authorities, some authorities, religious authorities, emerging actors like civil society, and uh, our partner, our, but our international partners, how to recognize the dignity of solution to our indigenous initiative based on culture and even on religions. Secularism does not mean to deny the place of religions in our very religious societies. It is certain, uh, uh, it is certain that uh, we risk the clash of ignorance rather than the clash of civilization. If you lock ourselves into the letter of the sacred scripture by killing the spirit, face it with the current development in the world, with the rise of populism, populism and extremism and all uh, on all sides, we must assume the courage of our other city to meet at the heart of our common human concerns. In the end, the determination of those who, who seek to erect worlds of conflict and war uh, should not deprive us uh, uh, of our common determination to build a bridge 
of dialogue and encounter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bakali, for that very insightful and rich statement, which will also give us further food of thought for our lessons learned and ways forward approach. With that, we are running out of time, so I will quickly open a question and answer session. We have got some questions from the floor, uh, which I will put to you, to the panelists. Uh, and there is one, the first we will begin with somebody who is participating, and I will mention who it is. Uh, I would request uh, George to make the question very precise. And then, if it's not directed to a particular panelist, any one of you feel free to give a very short answer uh, to that. So, George, the floor is yours. Um, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? No? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, thank you, Umush, for organizing another interesting panel discussion. Uh, at least two of your speakers touched upon the role of the state. However, Mr. Uh, Petito, Fabio Petito, touched upon the system of governance. He mentioned democracy, and he related very much uh, what happens to all the fields that you have mentioned uh, to how democratic a particular state is. So I'm, am I safe to assume then that the more democratic a country is, the greater attention and freedom and respect for these rights? Or put it conversely, do autocratic regimes, are there any autocratic regimes that allow these types of freedoms? Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, Fabio, would you care to respond to that very briefly? Yes, very briefly. Um, my reference to democratic society was mostly uh, to, uh, when I mentioned the example of the Council of Europe, which has this uh, reference uh, embedded in its missions, uh, and therefore articulate, uh, as also Reverend Lenz has mentioned. So it was specifically in this context, clearly democracy feature side. But now I think that actually the issue of interreligious dialogue and collaboration is something that can have many positive outcome in many different contexts where the governance does not need necessarily to be the liberal democratic one that applies uh, uh, in uh, the Council of Europe context. So um, uh, yeah, that's just to clarify, hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, I have uh, two questions from the floor because we have time limits, so we'll restrict ourselves to two questions. Uh, they are not addressed to any specific panelists, so I'll just quickly pose you the question and any one of the panelists can choose to reply, or two, but very briefly. One is, the first one is, isn't there an imperative to include women in the language of interfaith dialogue? This is an evident weakness in the Catholic, Catholic Muslim bridge building. Both are deeply patriarchal and built on the subordination of women and girls. Over to you, panelists. Umesh, can I take it? Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, it's rep it's definitely a challenge for religious communities to change the course of their leadership styles, not just in the uh, the Catholic and the Muslim traditions. Every religious tradition had that issue. If you bring traditional leadership, it will be mostly men, mostly older men, and mostly men who already have had investment in leadership. Uh, but uh, this will require for us to work very, very precisely with women. Um, I am a lay woman. I have a leadership role in my community. I have come up and played uh, leadership roles in interreligious dialogue as well. It requires what Professor Len said, an investment in women and their potential in leadership. So this is, this is going to be a long time effort, but I think if we begin with children uh, and children understand the language of equality, so much better than others, I think we will have to do. It cannot just be an aspiration. We will have to bring constructive ways uh, in which we can do that. It is by giving slots, so positive affirmation and, and reservation. It is by holding public uh, uh, the leadership spaces publicly accountable for its representation, but it's also by preparing leaders, uh, young people, and exposing them to religion. So it's not only religion. The capitalistic world, uh, the, the government world, all of them are equally, uh, I think, uh, guilty of this. 
And this is this is twenty first this is a twenty first century challenge that we have to work in, and and for women to also believe that uh, you know traditional leadership structures uh, will have to be modified and adapted, uh, and that will require again a very important uh, leadership initiative within interfaith dialogue to be able to 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 integrate lay women and their and their experience and expertise into leadership roles. Thank you, Mesh. Thank you, Vino. Naz, would you have something quickly to say about uh, this theme? Yes, it's crucially important and it's, uh, I mentioned it in my forthcoming report. Um, but I also think it speaks to the kind of events we're holding. We know that uh, women and children are central to community life in religious and belief communities. So if we are holding actual projects, if we are enabling those voices to come forward, if the topic is not symbolism and only open to leaders, then we will also even now hear from them. Thank you. I come to my the next question. Uh, again, as I said, uh, very briefly, any one of you uh, or two, but very briefly. Very interesting question. Are social media platforms doing more harm than good in fostering interfaith and intercultural understanding? And can and should these platforms be made more accountable if their actions lead to polarization? And how can this be achieved? Over to the panel. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, very interesting question. Uh, in our daily work in the Timbuktu Acid, we try to also uh, take uh, advantage from the social media. We have a sign it we have agreement with Google and with Meta in order to have a, a, a good alliance. Uh, they have the technology and we have the knowledge and how to prevent hate speech on online and also try to moderate uh, some some platforms. And I think that, uh, uh, as I'm saying uh, always, we cannot, uh, you know, our, our partners in the Sahel are, uh, are are spending a lot of money to to buy the weapons, to deploy military. And I I, I, I was sometimes saying that, you know, uh, we are in a, some countries where uh, building a school is more cheap, uh, cheaper than uh, uh, buying a second hand tank. And uh, we have to, to, to invest on education on, on uh, even online. And as we, 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 we see here in the Timbuktu, we have created um, uh, a website, uh, not, not a website, but a, a YouTube channel to, to fight uh, terrorism and, and, and extremism. And as you said sometimes is that uh, a Kalashnikov has never killed an ideology. We have to, to, to invest in education, invest in human capital. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the tendency is uh, very uh, uh, different from this way. And we have, uh, during this kind of dialogue, to emphasize on the role of education and the role of education uh, for peace and for dialogue. Thank you, Bakari. With that, given the time, I end the question and answer session and conclude by saying that the Geneva Center and myself personally, I would wish to really thank the esteemed panelists for their very valuable contributions indeed, and the participants for their high interest. This would, I'm sure, go a long way in implementing all the rich ideas and recommendations made here. The Geneva Center, as I had mentioned before, will issue a publication rapidly on this panel event, which will also include the lessons learned and ways forward chapter. To enable the speedy publication, we thank the panelists, already those who have submitted the written statements, and I request those who haven't as yet been able to, to do so at their earliest con convenience in order for the panel e publication to be out, put out as soon as possible. We are also happy to announce that the video of the event will be available shortly on our website and in social media. Once again, a heartfelt thank you to all and wishing you all success in your praiseworthy endeavors throughout the year.